The following program is presented by the Metropolitan Library Service Agency. Welcome to All About Kids, a program focusing on the interests of children and young people and some of the issues affecting them. Education is the issue which affects all children and parents and teachers. We're interested in the kind of curriculum, the teaching style, the way our children learn, and the learner outcomes. We're also interested in children's development of critical thinking, thinking skills and problem-solving ability. Our guest today is Mike Erdman a master teacher at Tesseract School in Egan. Mike has some very unique ideas about how the teaching of reading and language skills can be integrated into the curriculum in an unusual way. He has a great love of children's literature and he uses literature in his classroom to develop some of those critical thinking skills that are so important to children as they face the 21st century. The teaching of reading and language arts is being done at Tesseract School. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about Tesseract? Yes, I can, Gretchen. Um, I began my teaching career a little over 10 years ago in a small town in western North Dakota. My main responsibility in my first teaching position was to work with students who were a year or more behind in reading. So I had a core group of 10 to 12 students to teach during the year. When I got to the school and looked, at o looked over the materials and the supplies and everything, I discovered that there were um, a series of, of worksheets and activities that the students were using, and these were supposed to help them learn to love to read. So early in my career, I quickly decided that this didn't seem to be appropriate for these students, and I started adapting and changing the way I taught reading from then on. Well, how did you get involved with Tesseract, a really different type of non-traditional school? I had quit teaching in the public schools, was working on my PhD at the University of Minnesota. When I discovered Tesseract by accident, I saw an ad in the newspaper, and of course the word Tesseract, it comes from Madeline Lingle's book, and it's a, it's a unique word, a word that we're not too familiar with, so those of us that love children's literature would pick up on that word. They were having an open house, so I went out to the open house. Um, made myself feel very comfortable. They made me feel comfortable at the school. I then started to volunteer to come out and work with the second grade students. From then on, I became actively involved in the school as a consultant for the corporation that runs the school and then was asked to teach third and fourth grade. So my current involvement is as a master teacher in grades three and four, and I'm also responsible to help with in-service training for our new staff. We spent part of a day out at Tresnet. Tesseract and it's an incredible facility. Let's take a look at, at some of the shots of, of you and your students. Okay, thank you. That probably would be better. Okay. Well, boys and girls are ready to start our class today. We won't need your books for right now, so if you have a bookmark, you can go ahead and close your books up. The first thing that I'd like to talk about today is to talk a little bit about autobiographies. As you know, Little House in the Big Woods is an example of an autobiography. In, a little auto, in an autobiography like Little House in the Big Woods, the person who wrote it, in this case, Laura Ingalls Wilder, is telling about something that happened in her life, in the past. So that's what the book is about. It's an autobiography. A project that you've been working on yourself in class is an autobiography. Um, almost everyone in here has been working on that project. And I wanted to start our reading class today by talking a little bit about when you are writing an autobiography, <coughs> what are some of the things that are easy or some of the things that are hard about writing an autobiography? It's easy. What makes it easy? Because you know all about yourself. Because you know all about yourself. 
Anyone else like to talk about autobiographies? Okay, Eric? It's hard to find myself. Hard. Why is it hard? Um, I don't know. You just, uh, you just, you don't know what you, what you're going to write about. Okay. Any other comments? Okay, Sarah. When you are writing, you have to keep in mind that you're writing for an audience. Who do you think Laura Ingalls Wilder was writing for when she wrote her book? Herself. Okay. Joe herself said herself. And her family. Okay. Joe said herself and her and family. And she really had to think back. Yeah. She, she, this book was written in 1953. Laura Ingalls Wilder was already in her 50s about that time. So she had to think back a real long ways. Eric is going to be our first reader for today. Sometimes Uncle Henry and Uncle George, or Grandpa, came riding out of the big woods to see Pa. Ma would come out to the door and ask how the folks were. And she would say, Charles is working in the clearing. Then she would cook more dinner than usual, and dinner would be longer. Pa and Ma and the visitor half would be exactly half of hers, and Mary nibbled exactly Sometimes. half of her. Half so of each saved half and, and gave it to baby Carrie. But they always felt that somehow that wasn't quite fair. Sometimes a neighbor sent word that the family was coming to spend the day. Then Ma did extra cleaning and cooking and... That morning Laura had to stand still all along while well while Ma wound her hair firmly from the clusterings that combed it into long curls. Mary was Gretchen, already as we're watching this, I'd chair. really like to say that how important it is that successful oral reading experiences be provided for students to help build their confidence. I let the students know beforehand which sections I want them to practice. They work on expression, smoothness, and accuracy. Did you know that kids in most schools spend most of their time in reading class doing worksheets and skill sheets? I want my kids to really read. And she was swinging to read out loud, by one to read with a reading buddy, Which do you like best, Aunt Mary? to read silently. Mary asked, it's really Down made a big difference. Curls. Down the grooves into the board, uh, of the board Next into the pail. Morning, Next morning, Pa would take out the round pail and yellow cheese. Some people say she told them the new cheese did look like a round moon when it came up behind the trees. Bring us some honey. It was noon before they Pa were, came driving home. Laura had been watching for him. And she ran out to the wagon as soon as it stopped by the barnyard. If she hadn't spin, she could. I would like you to work on today, continue to work on pencil sketches. As you know, in our book, Garth Williams did pencil sketches when he did these illustrations. And you can work on one that you chose completely out of your own mind, or you can use the ones in the book for ideas to go by. And some people I've noticed already working on their second. Is there anyone starting on their third sketch yet? How many people have started on their second one already? Several people have, and that's just great. Somebody suggested an idea that you, if you do more than one sketch, that you put the sketches together and make like a sketchbook. That's a pretty neat idea. As I look around at the different pictures, um, Ryan, can you tell what your picture is about, what scene you're illustrating? Well, I'm illustrating, I'm drawing about when they're um, getting the sap out of the trees so that they can make maple syrup. Great. Looks really realistic too. I see this, the, the bucket hanging and then the, the tap, that's the spigot that's in the tree. Anyone else like to share what they're working on right now? Go ahead, Matt. I'm working on the picture in chapter 10 of the bear reaching into the tree to pull out honey. Aha, uh -huh. Joe's working on the same picture too. Let's see, what's, what do you find the most interesting part to draw so far? The tree. The tree? Did anyone tackle that one picture when Pa was chasing after 
what he thought was a bear and found out it was a tree stump and right, stiff. I'm going to do next. That's what you're going to do next? I think that one would be a real challenge to do. Yeah, that's what I was showing. Hey, Greta, what are you working on today? Um, I made a different, what, a different, it was the same one as Adam's, but... Yeah. One of the things I'm most proud of is that we really have fun in reading class. I found that my kids really love to draw. They love to sit and talk about their work and especially talk about their ideas while they work. And what's most important is that the atmosphere is exciting, accepting, but it's relaxing. Our program allows for this type of flexibility. Class sessions such as this one, where we might spend two or three periods, really help the children respond to literature. They can be creative. They can make their own choices about what they like to draw and about what they like to talk about. They are really proud of their work. This is just one example of how literature and the arts fit together. Um, hi, my name is Eric and here I am again about to talk about the library. Over here, up here and down here we have some books. Some over here by Laura's Ingle Wilder, and we're um, reading a book by Laura's Ingle Wilder called Little House in the Big Woods. And some books in this library are autographed, like um, King Big Goods in the Tub. It's um, an autographed by, by the writer to Mr. Erdman. Over here is one of my favorite books called Miss Nelson is Back. And um, it's a funny book. <laughs> Down here are some um, hardcover books. And Gretchen, I think the environment in the classroom must support reading. An easy way to do this is for us as classroom teachers is to create our own collections in our classroom. Having those books at arm's length, even though there's a, probably a great library right down the hallway, sends a real positive message to the kids. It tells kids that books are important and that we as teachers think they're important too. I know it's been a great day for reading in my class when I see that the bookshelves are a real mess and boy, they usually are. Hi, I'm Nina, and this is Greta, and we're going to tell you about the Best Book of the Year nominations. And here are just a few of them. We've got Veronica the Show-Off, The Secret Garden, Socks, There's a Boy in the Girl's Bathroom, Harold and the Purple Crayon, the Chocolate Touch. Those are just some of the books that we nominated. We've got 30 of them already. I want my kids to understand that they can make choices and that their opinions about books and literature are important. That's why we have the Best Book of the Year Award in my classroom. Children nominate and then vote for the book that they think is the Best Book of the Year. To us, this is an award that equals the Newberry and the Caldecott. Mike, that was not a traditional classroom. You have some very strong feelings about the importance of classroom environment. Would you talk a little bit about that, please? Just a few years ago, a study came out titled Becoming a Nation of Readers. And one of the key recommendations in that study was that classroom teachers and schools create an environment in the school, especially in the classroom, that emphasizes the importance of reading. And in the video, as you saw in the video, we have a classroom library in our, in our classroom. And having those books at arm's length is a very important part of our program. But also, besides that, um, I tell stories to the children. I read books. I tell um, 
find picture books. I read a wide variety of literature to the children. The children share books that they have written. I read books that they have written. We have silent reading times where the most, it's most important for me to be one of the readers with the children. We have as many opportunities during the regular school day to, to show that the teachers support reading and that the classroom environment itself supports reading. To me, it's a real key. As a children's librarian, I know that when teachers and school administrators support reading in those kinds of ways, it makes a difference. The kids are in the library after school and they're demanding the books that you've started to read. Yes, it does. So it's a real way of building partnerships. Mm -hmm. As a parent, I have some real concerns about the volume of worksheets and workbook pages that come home with, with children, and I wonder what is your opinion of that method of trying to find out how children are achieving? I think that the method, the, the, I guess we can now call it the traditional method of teaching reading, where students spend most of their time in workbooks or in worksheets in reading class, is a method that I, I don't approve of at all. Um, I think it, it, it does everything from limits creativity to making children bored with what goes on in the classroom. Worksheets and skill sheets are have been created by companies, textbook publishing companies, that publish basal materials to help, supposedly, to help the teachers teach all of the skills that are necessary to teach reading. The skills have been broken down into minute sub-skills. And people like myself contend that the better way to teach reading is to teach reading as part of communication and part of language and not as minute sub-skills. Therefore, I don't use workbooks and skill sheets that work on specific skills, and I will not use them. Congratulations. You're encouraging a love of reading and a lifelong enjoyment, and I think that was one of the things that came out of a nation of readers, too. Mm -hmm. uh, but are you sure that you really are teaching reading? The children that we observed were, were doing a good job with Little House on the Prairie. Why do the textbook publishers emphasize such formalized and standardized ways of teaching reading? That's a good question that has many possible answers, I think. Um, I, I think one of the primary reasons is because many teachers and many school systems want to have specific scope and sequences. They want to know what skills, supposedly, are made up, are needed to teach reading, and then they want to be able to, to have the accountability of saying, I taught that skill, I taught that skill, I taught that skill, I taught that skill. If, with that type of accountability, I think it makes teachers feel comfortable and they feel like they're really teaching. Well, I contend that if you want to be a good reader and learn to love to read, that you have to read good books and that you have to ha let children have time to read orally every day, silently every day, and most importantly, you have to let children have the time to respond to the books that they read. For example, when in, the, in the video that you saw from our school, we were having an art um, lesson, art class right along with reading class. That was important, but what was even more important was that the kids and I were sitting around a table, we were talking literature the whole time and talking about the books, and I think they learned more from that than any formal discussion or formal lecture or formal worksheet or presentation that I could ever make. Because you were sharing, you were excited about the books, the children were excited, and they look at you as a role model, I'm sure. One of the things that's always bothered me as, as a children's services librarian is that teachers often use only the same book list that they got when they took children's literature 20, 20 years ago. They're mm -hmm. not very interested. They don't seem to have a desire to, to keep up with the fact that there are new and wonderful books coming out all the time. And when they use only their old stock lists and stock That's worksheets, it, it does seem boring. I'm sure that if teachers got together and talked about children's books in the same exciting way that you and I have been talking about it this morning, that there would be a difference in children's attitude I about think so. Reading. I definitely think so. How does your program really help meet the individual needs of students? Do children read different books? You don't expect every child to be reading Little House on the Prairie. You, you hit the children where they're at in terms of their interests and ability. The program is divided up into many different components. I did ask all of my fourth grade students to read Little House in the Big Woods, which is a book that we just are just finishing reading now. And, but one of the students said, well, Sturdman, I've already read that book. And I said, 
that's fine, Joe. What I'd like you to do then is to sit down and think what you would like to do. Write a plan for me. What would you like to learn about? Well, he ended up deciding to read the book again, but he didn't want to sit through all of the class discussions with it because he was very comfortable with the book. He did his project, he did his plan, and it turned out very well. Um, meeting individual needs of the students is a, one of the cornerstones of our school. When a student comes to our school, we look carefully at the student and we assess what, how they learn. We want to find out if they're a visual learner, an auditory learner, or a kinesthetic learner. We want to find that out. And then when I plan teaching, instead of going and getting a textbook or something that's been prepared for me that tells me how to teach something, I will go get a book. Once I have the book in my hand, I will think, okay, now what can I do, what can we do that will really help the visual learners learn? What can we do that will help the people that need a lot of hands-on activities to learn? And that's how the program is planned, to more to meet the individual needs of the students rather than to teach to a specific curriculum. Our overall goals and objectives are always kept in mind, of course, but then we work towards those individual needs. It's obviously a really unique sort of teaching and a sort of school concept. Why don't you think more more school administrations, more school districts are picking up on this sort of an idea? I think, I think the, the fears of, of accountability are part of it. I think that many classroom teachers are afraid to be creative and are afraid to try new ideas. I think that people in, that are classroom teachers often would prefer to have a res, sort of follow so, a recipe, so to speak, of how to teach something. And those that all focuses on a specific program instead of focusing on on the customer, on the student. And I think that school boards and parents are concerned that their students do well on standardized tests. That's important to them, even though standardized tests only measure a certain thing. They don't measure creativity and other very important things, of course. But I think that's one of the reasons it's very difficult for for the traditional programs in schools, most schools follow the tradition. It's different. It's hard for them to break from tradition and to try something new. And I think it is catching on and there will be a huge, uh, huge changes in reading in the future because I go to conferences and listen to people and talk to teachers and more and more people are getting fed up with with basal reading texts that are published by publishing companies that are only interested in making money. They're more Teachers seem to be more as a group gathering together and saying, no, nope, put those aside. Let's use real literature and get kids to really like reading and love books. A lot of the basal readers are so bland, too. There was an article recently that talked about because of the enormous pressures on publishers, they've taken out anything that would be controversial either in illustration or in text, and so you, you end up with not so much quality. It seems to me that, that my kids are being taught pretty much the same way I was taught. A teacher standing mm -hmm. up in front of the classroom, uh, you know that when you get into the seventh or the eighth grade, this is going to be exactly what the homework assignment is going to be. These mm -hmm. are the subjects mm -hmm. for the term papers. And it's discouraging because I was in school a long time ago. And if we're looking toward an informed populace in the next century, it seems to me if our educational system doesn't change the way you've been describing it, we're, we're in trouble. I agree. When you're teaching, though, I can't see you standing up there with a piece of chalk in your hand. Do you pace around? Do you, you obviously integrate reading into to a lot of different curriculum areas. Uh, how, how do you face the class? I like to do, most of the time, I like to do what the children are doing. I feel if it's something that's important for them to do, it's certainly important enough for me to be doing with them. When we are sketching or drawing and having our conversations, I sketch and draw. I love it. It's one of my favorite times to be with the children because we can share things. I view the classroom teacher's role more as a facilitator of learning, like a manager of a store, a manager of a learning store, let's say where my role is not to dispense information, but my role is to help guide people, to explore their own interests, to help guide people within the curriculum and the materials that, they are, that we are using to, to learn the things that they're interested in and to explore and to go way beyond learning the essential facts of information. So my role is really more of a, as a facilitator, an encourager, a person who gives lots of hugs 
and lots of pats on the backs and lots of um, lots of you know handshakes. Good job for doing things. Sounds great. Have you been charged with being elitist that you appeal only to a certain small percentage of children who can can uh, go to Tesseract? Our students yes. at Tesseract are, come from a very varied. They're a very varied student body, and I think that there is really no there is no feeling of elitism in any way. Uh, many of the students come to our school because they didn't fit into the public schools that were in the area or other private schools that were in the area. The parents send their kids there because we're a new school of thought. We think in a different way. We approach the students as individuals. That's what we're concerned about. And I think that's, that's if there's anything elite, that's that we have maybe elite parents who really care about their children, not elite students. Our students are are great. They're, they're kids. They're great kids. Or their parents who at least are investigating mm -hmm. options and have mm -hmm. the, the luxury of doing that. We've only got time for one more quick okay. question and what I want to ask you is there, there have been some recent studies talking about the, the positive role model a male teacher can, can give to students particularly in the early elementary and, and even preschool years and obviously you're the kind of teacher I'd like my boys to have. Well, thank you. <laughs> how, how do you see that? in terms of being an elementary school teacher? I think that it's, if an elementary school can have a staff that is half men and half women, that would be just perfect. And at our school, with our master teachers, that's exactly what we have. We have a kindergarten male teacher, we have a, a fifth and sixth grade male teacher, and then we have, well, we're divided exactly in half, and I think that is, is really the best, the best environment. It's a natural environment for the children to be in. Well, we're faced with a lot of issues in terms of schools and a lot of studies that show how schools aren't doing what they should be. It seems to me if they'd take your advice, <laughs> we'd all be in a lot better shape. Mike, thank you very much for being with us today on All About Kids. Thank you, Gretchen. And we will certainly have you back again. Well, thank you. I'd love to come back. It was wonderful to have Mike on the program today. We've had a great time talking about children's books in the breaks between shooting. We also appreciate the cooperation of Tesseract School and the children who appeared on our video. Thanks for joining us on All About Kids. Please tune in again. This has been a presentation of Hennepin County Library in conjunction with the Twin Cities Metropolitan Library Service Agency. We thank you for watching and we hope you visit your public library often.